I want to tell you about Sandeep Shroff. Sandeep has over 20 years of experience in finance, investment analysis, strategic planning, and technology. And uh, he's been CFO, he's done fundraising, he's sort of done everything in the finance arena. He was co-founder at Gridstone Research. He raised four rounds of funding. He grew the company to about 350 in headcount. And he has a master's in computer science from Syracuse and an MBA from Haas. Yay, Haas, go Bears. Okay, but when, you know, there's some other, that's sort of his formal bio, but the more fun thing is I found an interview with him. I don't know what year that was, Sandeep. Uh-oh. Uh-oh, <laughs> right, yeah, exactly. Um, so now one of the reasons I really like what Sandeep does, it's his company's called My Startup CFO, and I met him at Berkeley Skydeck because he does a lot, of, um, a lot of mentoring over there, is he has a social mission. So uh, you know, his main mission is to help startups figure out uh, finance and budget and do it cost effectively. But his social mission is to support and empower women, help close the gender gap in the workplace. So he hires women uh, who work from home and do the work that, um, the bookkeeping work, the accounting work, and the CFO work. And, and this is very specifically his target population of employees. So I really like that about um, what he's doing. But as he describes himself, he said, my first 10 years were as a hands-on computer programming geek in Silicon Valley startups. The second 10 years were analyzing tech companies on Wall Street, which I did not like much, explanation point, and working in finance roles in tech companies. The third 10 years are a culmination of tech finance and the previous 20 years of nonprofit work in the women and children's literacy field in India. So he is um, a well-rounded man, and he's gonna tell you why you need to bring someone financial in pretty early. He said, not every startup can afford a CFO, but the investment structuring, equity option allocation, spending, and human resource decisions you make in the early stages of your business can make or break you. If that last sentence makes you yawn, you need our services more than you thought. <laughs> I've worked with hundreds of companies, hundreds of startups, and one thing always holds true for all of them, fail none. That's my deep research. Everybody who runs out of cash dies. So hang on to your money. Uh, cash is very important. And uh, going to what Pete was saying earlier, watch your cash carefully. What I'm going to talk of mostly on the mechanics of the financial planning. Uh, if you want to ask any other questions unrelated to this, I'm OK with that. Um, I've done fundraising. I've been in meetings where your hands start to tremble and you start to sweat. And uh, you know when you're talking and people go on their Blackberries slash iPhones, I've, you know, how does it feel and how do you want to bang their head against the wall that I've been there. So if you want some tips on that, I'm okay. Anyway, a financial plan is nothing but the income statement and balance sheet of a company for n number of forward years. n is generally about two, maybe three. Uh, made mostly on a monthly basis. Uh, I know Pete talked of a quarterly basis. Uh, but uh, for a startup as young as we're talking of here, a quarter is too long a time period. Things can go wrong uh, and uh, you will not know. So in my view, <coughs> if, 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 if your path, if you're a train, your startup is a train, you've got a track you're going on, uh, the model is these guardrails that you set up around the, uh, at a little height around the train. So as you start to wobble, you're taking a turn too fast or there's too much crosswind and your train has to wobble, you start to clank against the guardrails called the budget uh, or the financial model or uh, financial plan. The idea is that every month you will sit down with your accountant, CFO, whatever, or yourself uh, and say, okay, I planned for this, I did this, where did I go wrong? Your assumptions will go wrong. You know, you can go wrong happily 200 million to 4 billion. Or you can go wrong and you say, you know, I'll have a product in 18 months and you have zilch, or the FDA disapproved or whatever, or rejected. So things can go wrong either way, but it's good to take a breather at the end of the month and say, hey, uh, are we good or not good? And if I'm going wrong, where am I going wrong? Now, one of the things with uh, being a startup founder, CEO, is that it's a lonely job. Nobody will tell you you're screwing up. So you have to be a very highly self-correcting human being. And if you can't 
you know, look in the mirror and say, you know, all my hair are gone, uh, you're just fooling somebody else. So, uh, so you have to be kind of know, you know, what's going on. You have to be able to tell yourself you're screwing up. So, the basic purpose of the financial plan tells the investors how much money you need, where will the money come from, and at what rate will you spend. Uh, when will you run out? That's your runway issue. Rate of spend is, you know, what's your cash burn? All the words that Pete used, my words are slightly different, but they mean the same thing, and I'll keep using them interchangeably. Uh, uh, there is no right or wrong in a plan. Uh, you're a hardware company, it takes $25 million to make the first chip. You're a mobile gaming company, half a million dollars, and you have the first revision of the game, right? Uh, in a chip company, you're selling to big guys. You have heavy hitting salespeople who know people at the right places. You know, you have two sales guys, they need to make two, three sales and you're done. Mobile gaming, you need to spend $2 million on Apple App Store or Google Play to get your you know, organic use. So different models, different companies. If you're a device company, if you're a pharma company, the, the economics are very, very different. You know, pharma companies, by and large, you know, they have to consume, you know, 100 to 500 million dollars before the first molecule is available for public consumption. You know, it's eight to 10 year time cycle. So it's a very different uh, investor set who invest in different, you know, the, the, the risk appetite, the uh, patience levels are very different for different investors. So every company will have different requirements. Don't, don't go by, I saw this model on so and so's blog and it says I have to be cash flow break even in 18 months. By the way, if any startup says I'll be cash flow break even in 18 months, that's the first you know, notch down on your you know, uh, credibility. Nobody goes cash flow positive that fast, I mean, unless and until you just hit gold in the ground and you know, out comes something. So other than that, very, very difficult. What is a good plan? Uh, I look at a financial plan, uh, so I, I make this uh, analogy. A, a map is to a real life, Google Maps to the real life terrain is what your financial plan is to your real books. It has to be detailed enough to show you the way, but if it's too detailed, you get lost. I, I don't know if you guys have tried looking at the satellite view of your Google map on your phone. You don't know what the hell's going on. It's just too much detail to comprehend. So it has to be objective. It has to be detailed enough, yet not so detailed that you get lost. You know, your actuals will track, you know, how much coffee is being brought into the office. Uh, but the financial plan doesn't need to say, you know, each human being will drink four cups of coffee a day, you know, seven employees, 28 cups, multiplied by 22 working days, blah, blah. Too much detail. You say kitchen food, you know, kitchen budget, $100 per employee per month. End of story. Whether it's coffee or tea, you don't care. So that's what I mean. You have to abstract enough details. Uh, being objective, big deal. Uh, you are by definition subjective. It's your idea, it's your baby. You know, everybody's baby is prettier than the other guys. Uh, you will not admit it's ugly, you will not admit it's dying, but hey, you know, life happens. So be objective about it. You know, as I say to everybody, you know, sell the Kool-Aid, just don't drink it. <laughs> so it's your job to sell others. Tell your sources of income. Uh, you will have no income in the beginning for a foreseeable future. Uh, Income meaning revenue, that you sell a product and you get money. Cheapest money on the planet is called revenue, by the way. If you take investor money, either you'll give up equity or you will be in debt that you have to give the money back. Cheapest money is provide services, get revenue, great. But that's not going to happen in the foreseeable future. That's where investors come in. Consumers of cash, salaries, rent, the biggest two consumers of your cash, if you are in some kind of a Pharma situation, if there are lots of chemicals to be bought or a lot of machinery to be bought, that will be another consumer of cash. The biggest thing that people don't get a handle on, what's your fixed versus variable, right? Uh, fixed cost is you need that to get things started. You need an office, right? Uh, variable things are which move up and down with time with the uh, either the growth of the company or number of units you're putting out. I want to put five machines out, okay? You need to buy five chips, five chassis, you know, five this, five that, all that. The biggest, the biggest fallacy in the fixed versus variable world is people are not variable cost. If somebody tells you people are variable cost, they either don't know finance, they're not an entrepreneur, they've never run a company. I'll stand up to anybody who says people are variable cost. Hey, that's nonsense. Now, people are a fixed cost for the simple reason 
that you need a bare minimum team that you need to run with. And you can't just swap out and swap in. There is a certain skill set they bring in. Now you're seeing a downturn doesn't mean you fire half the people and say, you know what, I'm having a cash crunch. I'm going to fire you for six months. I'll see you in July. It's not going to happen. So people are fixed. There's a hiring cost, training cost, chemistry, team, all that stuff. So once you hire people, they're with you. If they go away, they go away, right? <clears throat> They'll not come back. Uh, the other thing, uh, allow your model to be flexible. Flexible meaning, you know, life changes. Uh, you know, don't hard code values in every cell. I think my next slide talks of, yeah, talks of learn Excel. If you don't know Excel, then you're up the bad creek with nothing in your hand. Uh, don't even try. So learn Excel, it's a tool of the trade. Excel, Google Sheet, whatever, paper, pencil doesn't work, your head doesn't work. You can't comprehend that many numbers and keep them straight. So have Excel, learn to use the tool appropriately, uh, learn to model different scenarios uh, in the sense that, okay, you know, I thought I'll have revenue now, but now I'm going to shift out six months or my cost structure has changed because I'm going to open a center some other city or I'm shutting down here, whatever, whatever. Life happens, changes. So have, have your model in a way uh, that you can change the scenario because modeling should not become an albatross around your neck that you made this you know, beautiful pal palace called my model and now it, you, know, you can't change. The walls should be movable. Right? Uh, because if you make a very beautiful model and it doesn't work in two months, you've just wasted all your time. Right? Uh, the biggest thing that's going to happen is uh, you're going to fall short on the cash front. Right? Uh, one of the things I had written down when Pete was uh, talking, it always takes longer than you think. It always requires more money than you think. Right? Uh, so you will fall short of cash on your plan somewhere or the other. So 20 to 30 percent buffer, that's his number, my number is 100 percent. If you're wrong by only a factor of two, you're doing pretty good. Uh, so I say whatever you say, you're going to do, raise double of that. Not at the 10 to 20 million level, of course, but if it's at a million dollars, you're probably going to take two million dollars. right? Uh, because there is something called too much money. It will kill you. You know, you lose a sense of, you know, you, lo you, you lose your true north when there is too much money. Ah, I got $10 million in the bank, I can go sign this lease of you know, 10,000 a month. But it's not 10,000 a month, you just signed for 60 months, 10,000 a month, and you're five employees. Because you're going to grow to 50 employees in six months, right? Guess what? You never grow and now you've got this albatross of 600,000 hanging around your neck called the lease. It's too much money can make you go wonky on your decisions. So, so my thing is, that, you know, Raise enough buffer, but not too much. So as I said, learn Excel. Supremely important, learn Excel. The exercise you're doing is you're mentally going back and forth in time. It's called constructing a company. So you have to say, okay, today I'm one people, you know, I am, I am the scientist kinds, I need the admin kinds, I need the finance kinds, or whatever else you need. So you have to understand what the complementary skill sets are to you. What kind of team you want to build, you know, once I'm at six months, now I need a writer for my, you know, FDA application. You know, what does that guy cost? Et cetera, et cetera. So you have to think through various aspects of the company. It could be the admin side, the scientific side, financial side, marketing side, selling side, you know, business partnership, channel partnerships, and whatever your strategy is. Uh, so you, uh, so and I'll show it to you in the model what I, always suggest is have a whole bunch of ratios in the, uh, you know, like about I call output ratios. Uh, I know that when I have 10 engineers or 10 scientists, I should have a product out in six months, so I should hire my first sales guy, right? I know one sales guy can get me a million dollars a year revenue. So if you go to 10 million revenue or your number of sales people is two, there is a problem. Now you forgot to hire enough sales people. Your margins will look fantastic. Right? Because you have 10 million sales and you have two sales guys and 10 engineers. Now that is not a company, it doesn't exist. So, so these are the things you have to monitor that am I, is my company in balance? You know, you have 10 customers but no customer support. That's a bad, bad thing. So all those things, if you have output ratios and, and the values of the ratios, what is the acceptable range for your thing is, is, is your company's thing. You know, my company may be uh, selling something else, I have a quota of half a million dollars per salesperson per year. You may be selling something else, your salespeople are costlier and your you know, size could be two million dollars of revenue per uh, quota per salesperson per, per year. 
So anyway, the, what I'm saying is the ranges are different for different companies, but there is always the quote unquote right range. Anything outside of it should start you know, ringing your alarm, alarm bells. So that's what I was saying, you know, these are the ratios. Uh, the other thing, uh, you know, Stephanie also mentioned, and uh, Pete also mentioned, financials are the figment of our imagination of a person like me. We are finance guys, right? Finances mean jack. Right? US gap, all that, these are all financial standards. This, the financials mean are created by finance people and they only make sense to finance people. You know, scientists are kind of lost in the bargain. Like, what? You know, where did this come from? Well, that was a $10 million machine which was depreciating over 10 years. But I just spent 10 million bucks. No, you didn't spend 10 million dollars. You're going to spend 1 million per year. A theoretical construct. You've lost 10 million bucks on an expensive machine, you're gone. Right? So you have to understand uh, the operating metrics. You know, your salary budget is not half a million a month. Your salary budget is, you know, 50 guys making 10,000 a month. Because you control the 10,000, you control the 50. You don't control the half a million. That is just a financial construct, which happens to be 50 multiplied by 10. So, uh, make the financial model based upon things that you control. How many units will I sell? What is the price of that unit? How many salespeople does it take? Etc. Etc. So, don't go by, uh, don't try to construct a financial model. Construct an operating model and let it spit out whatever financials it does. Right? I'm going to hire a sales guy whose quota is a million dollars a year. But it takes six months for this guy to understand my product and go in the market. So first six months, he's consuming money. Right? Seventh month is the first time this guy spits out a deal. Or our product is so complex and its a sale is a CIO level or a you know, medical director level. Uh, and in a hospital, it takes 18 month sales cycle. So that's what you know. So which means you build in that I need a pipeline of 10 hospitals today so that in 18 months, I have one sale. Because 10 in one closes and it takes 18 months to close the deal. So that's the thinking process that you need to have underlying your model. So the operating things will make you think through, you know, if I have employees, you know, there is FICA FUTA payroll tax to be paid. If I have employees, so I have a ratio called square feet to employees. How much space did you rent and how many employees do you have? I mean, are you squeezing your employees into, you know, four square feet that all sit like that and, you know, not do anything? Or you have a massive office where, you know, each employee is consuming 500 square feet, right? I've had a company and I refused to work with them uh, because they raised too much money. And I met the CEO in the new office. And uh, there were 25 people. And he had a San Francisco long city block, long office. I said, okay, here's the people. That's your football pitch and that's your golf course. He goes, no, 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 we are going to expand. We are just coming from a small office. And we were like, yeah, too close. I'm like, that's not a guy you want to work with. Because he's just thought of that he's going to be a 200-person company. He signed a five-year lease today with 25 people. And I mean, literally, he had like, you know, 400 square feet per employee. And by and large, you're looking at 70, 80 square feet per employee, you know, working space, 100 square feet at max. Uh, so those are the kind of things you have to control and uh, look for. So these are, you know, the various other, uh, various other, uh, uh, some of these don't apply to you. These are gaming oriented, software oriented. Uh, but, you know, what's my lifetime value of the customer? What's my customer acquisition cost? Uh, remember, if, if you're selling a dollar bill for 90 cents, uh, you're not doing too good. If your customer acquisition cost is a buck, uh, or, or, you know, and then you, you know, customer gives you back 90 cents, you're never going to turn cash flow positive. So, so be aware of a lifetime value of customer is, you know, for example, in, in, in medical case, let's say you're selling a machinery and it has consumables in it, whether that's slides or strips or whatever, you know, your classic being your sugar testing stuff. You know, they'll sell the machine at a loss or even free because they're going to make money on the strips which use five a day. You know, your classic razor blade strategy. So lifetime value would be how many strips will one diabetic uh, use over the you know, life of one of those machines. So you have to figure all of that out and then it's okay, how much? So, so customer acquisition cost can be very high in the beginning because you know you want to recover the money and this guy going, ain't going nowhere. So think through what you know, the churn rate is, how quickly, you know, bad example, but I'll give nonetheless, how quickly will your patient die? You know, half the pharma companies are far, far, 
pricing the drug, well, it's only going to elongate your life for six months. So I have to recover at least half a million dollars in six months. So there you go. There's your $100,000 a month price for the drug. People do different things differently, but anyway, so those are the you know, things you need to look at. How do you get the funding? This is a little bit overlap with what Pete was saying. Uh, everybody requires a financial plan with assumptions. Financial plan means there is an assumption in that. The whole idea is that they will test not so much so for the financials, but for the underlying assumption. What's your assumption on a productivity per sales guys or the sales cycle? Or you, know, you may say you have an office in San Francisco and you tell me you're going to have an office at $25 per square foot per year. Okay, no, something's wrong. You know, that's, that's, that's not San Francisco price. So people, they will ask you. So have a model such that, and I'll show you the sample model right after. Have a model such that those assumptions are clearly stated out. And if somebody wants to look at it, you send them a model, and here it is. Because if you bury those things inside of, you know, cell number A3 has that, and Q33 has that, on, on the fifth tab, seventh row, eighth cell, that model will never work. So assumptions, that you want to make them clearly upfront so that they can see. Uh, also, the type and source of funds, uh, the, the quantification of the thing uh, determines where you go money, uh, to ask for money. If you're looking for a half a million, million dollar seed round, that's not exactly a VC round, right? I mean, that's an angel round. These are angel means these are rich individuals. They understand your field. They will not take you through the due diligence of an institutional investor. Uh, most likely, you know them. Uh, the first round, the first two, three rounds, in any case, are your reputation-based rounds. You know, it's all, you ask any VC, they say, we, you know, it's a team reputation. Ideas come and go. Uh, people remain same, you know, has these teams worked together before or not? Or did you just come together outside the room and you say we are friends? No, it doesn't work like that. So they are looking at, team risk is the biggest risk for VCs, right? You know, you fight and you leave and boom, there goes their money. Uh, so they will test you for those kinds of things. Uh, and they need kind of proof point at times. You know, the, the most famous example of this team and team risk, uh, mm -hmm. there was this company called Color, C-O-L-O-R, color.com I believe was their website. Uh, and they had the most star-studded founding team that you can have. Uh, head of people in you know, data science from LinkedIn and some head of this from Facebook or head of that from Google. I mean, it's like A-class players. But guess what? Everybody's a stud. You know, how many stars can one planetary system have? I guess you can't have three. <laughs> $40 million raised. First round of money. $40 million raised. Sequoia Capital leading the round. Four zero. I don't even know what the pre-money valuation was. I mean, it's unheard of. People have a Series C or a Series D. After you had, you know, what Pete was showing, the milestones. I mean, it's on the fourth milestone that you'll go raise 40 million. These guys just get out of their garage and 40 million bucks. And I think it company didn't last six months. Because, you know, spectacular blow up. You know, I am right, you're an idiot. No, no, I am right, you're an idiot. That kind of stuff. Read up, you know, color.com with a very colorful story. No pun intended. Uh, so, so anyway, so back to the point of, you know, the amount of money that you're trying to raise is the, is the determines what kind of, you know, capital uh, source you're going for. Uh, in, in, in bio and pharma and medical, all that stuff, you'll run into a VC round very quick because you guys consume just a lot of money. You, you, you specialize equipment, specialized chemicals, the kind of talent you guys want is very highly specialized. Um, anything less than a PhD is good for nothing but sweeping the floors. So, you know, your guys are expensive, so you need a lot of money. So VCs are your round, maybe right after the first round, you know. And those do specialized VCs who understand, you know, uh, people like Pete, they understand what your chemistry is, you know, what the biology is, and they can fund it for a long time. Uh, you obviously need a finance guy, you don't need a finance guy right away. You don't need a full-time guy for sure. Because, you know, need is very sporadic. There's a funding round or there is some strategic M&A discussion or you have a partnering discussion or licensing or revenue sharing discussion. You need a CFO level guy. Uh, and, and, in your, uh, in, and in your case, you guys need a very specialized CFO. You know, a, a generic CFO is good enough, you know, maybe. But uh, the kind of deals you guys sign, it needs very highly specialized uh, finance knowledge and, you know, what the licensing are or where the pitfalls are. You know, a large company may wrap you up in a bear hug of some sort that you are theirs forever. You become kind of slave labor at that point in time. So you have to have a good uh, you know, finance guy, CFO guy who's uh, helping you guys out in that. Anyway, this is my pitch part of it. I know uh, Pete said earlier that you, know, you can wait for good financials for a while, you know, 50K revenue or 500K raise. Uh, I, I, I disagree with him uh, for selfish reasons. 
uh, that uh, you know you have to have clean books right up front. If if I mean, I've had enough number of times where you know entrepreneur will give them a book with here my income statement, balance sheet, cash flow. This is what we are doing. And a week later, say, hold on, hold on. I you know retrieve that. Here's the real stuff. And you know people get jittery. If you can't count your money, you know what good are you? How do I know you're not screwing up other stuff? So be be very fastidious on the books. Even if you can't do it, hire somebody outsource to do it. Uh, you don't need full-time people, part-time people will work, uh, but talk to them guy. Ask them your accountant questions, you know, but even a bookkeeper. Uh, if, 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 uh, if you say, hey, how much cash did I burn? If the answer is, um, uh, let me look up. Bad answer, fire the accountant. Uh, I think it was 100K, fire the accountant. Right? So, an accountant or a bookkeeper should come to you with pat answers. You know, these are five, six, seven questions that you should know. You know, a good accountant should have anticipated the question. What's your cash burn? When am I going to run out of money? How much money is in the bank? How much is my receivable? How much is my payable? These are very standard, simple questions. And, and you don't have to worry about all these big words. I mean, you just have to say, how much money do I have? Till when will I last? If you can have those two things in your mind at all points in time, what Stephanie was saying, keep a close eye on your cash. See, you know, where the money is going. So, uh, and, and this is the thing that I was said earlier, monitor actual versus budget. Uh, at a reasonably detailed level. This is where I said, set up those guardrails. If the train's going wonky, you know, hey, what assumptions are going wrong? Is my rent assumption wrong? Is my salary assumption wrong? Is my productivity assumption wrong? And my people, I thought they will produce some usable stuff in six months. It's taking you know, a year. Something has gone wrong. Be aware what's gone wrong. So one of the things you know, people don't understand is what are the outputs of money? Outlets of money, not outputs. Uh, as she said, Stephanie said, a credit card with every employee is a bad idea. Because that's a, you know, take, take, your, uh, um, take your cash balance on the balance sheet to be a tank full of water. Question is, how many leaks do you have in that? Now, how many faucets have you put in there and given, you know, a credit card with me is one faucet, credit card with him is another faucet. One of us may go berserk, right? And, and uh, as much as you like your employees, uh, Somebody is either not honest or somebody is either not competent and human beings all make mistakes, right? Uh, and if, the, if I tell you the kind of stuff I have found on people's, you know, companies' expense, expenses, it's not even funny, right? Uh, you can very quickly, you know, I, I, I always tell people, give me anybody's expense report, I'll give you 80% sketch of their character right there. How people spend their money is a remarkably transparent way to figure out where their morals lie. In, in, it's just not, not to be said on camera later. <laughs> but, but, but so watch the expense reports, right? I'll, I'll give you an on camera example on which I fired a guy. Uh, guy gives me an expense report. I'm the CFO of my company. We've raised 30 million bucks. We have 350 people. I'm a picky guy. And plus, I have nothing else to do. I'm the founder. I've hired people. So now I just watch expense reports. <laughs> so this guy gives me an expense report. He's gone to New York. Uh, and uh, the VP of sales says, approved, salesman, New York trip, whatever, 1800 bucks, done. So I get the thing, I'm supposed to write the check. So office manager nicely brings me the, this is before all the SaaS tools were around, this 2005, six. So I get a clipped up uh, you know, expense report, the check filled out, I just had to sign and boom, go. I said, no, just thumbing through the expense report. It says breakfast, $7. Does that ring a bell to anybody? Breakfast, $7? A guy flew from San Francisco to New York. Breakfast, seven dollars. Any ideas? Should we ring a bell or no? No. McDonald's. McDonald's. Does it even ring a bell with anybody? United. United. United meal tickets. <laughs> Expenses are never round numbers. You will never find a meal for seven dollars. It's six ninety-five, seven o two, right? I'm like. $7 sounds weird. So I'm like flipping through the, where is the $7 receipt, right? The expense versus breakfast. <laughs> Guess what the receipt says? Any ideas? San Francisco to New York. Guy came in a little early to the airport. Shoe shine. <laughs> the guy paid seven bucks to get his shoes shined at the airport and jacks me with the bill. I said, you're done. <laughs> I mean, it was just one of those, you know, it's the small things that show your character, okay? Now you'll be very careful and elaborate about a thousand dollar fraud, but you think seven dollars you can just slip by. Mm -hmm. To me, that's a big thing, right? I mean, I'm, I'm picky, I'm a finance guy, I'm miserly to an extreme. Uh, but, you know, 
but it's worked out to my advantage. It's simple as that. And I'm not ashamed to say that on camera. So, <laughs> so anyway, so, so control those outputs of cash. Very, very important. You will go wrong. Assumptions will go wrong. Have a tab on what am I going to cut when push comes to shove. Right? Even whether it's stack ranking your people, uh, stack ranking your expenses in some way, saying that, okay, uh, we'll cut back our San Diego office. Or we'll call those people to be here, I want to cut that rent. Or whatever else, or we shut down that product or project, whatever. In, in. So have a sense of what's the core of the company. Right? If there's a big flood coming, what will I catch hold in this office and run? Have that list in your mind. Because the flood will come. Guaranteed. What people am I letting go? It, it sounds very, you know, sad and you know, morose. But you have to plan for uh, plan for bad times. I just talked of this. You know, put tight controls on exit of money. You know, two eyes always. You know, rather two pairs of eyes always look at money output, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, use an accounting system. Excel is not accounting. Paper pencil is not accounting. Your head is definitely not accounting. Uh, use some accounting system, even if it's wrongly used, but it's something there. So this is uh, just just do this last part. Stop doing accounting yourself. Your job is only to sell. A founder just sells. Uh, I think I'm going to go to the actual model. And I will walk you through what an actual model looks like. This is a sample uh, template. That's the salary, that's the bonus, that's the benefits I'm going to pay per person. Uh, and this is the loaded cost. And everybody gets a 14% overhead, payroll overhead, meaning if I give somebody $100,000, their actual cost to me is $114,000. Out of this 14,000, 14%. Uh, seven percent is straight away FICA FUTA, right? The whole security and the Medicare that you pay from your side, you pay about seven and a quarter. The company pays another seven and a quarter. So fifteen percent goes to the government of all wages being paid in the U.S. All employees take vacation. If you have two week vacation, two weeks out of fifty-two is about four percent. So there's your eleven percent. Some other riff raff buffer, right? In real life, if you have vacation, this, that, everything, uh, your overhead comes to about twenty percent. Right? What kind of healthcare benefits you provide? Are you going to pay 50% uh, for the employee and zero for the dependents? Are you going to pay 100% for the employee, 50% for dependents? So what part of the employee premium will you pick up determines what's your cost, right? So wage is inflating at 4%. Uh, this I'll show you in a second. This year number zero, I'll tell you in a sec what happens. Uh, benefits are generally inflating at a higher rate. Uh, that's just fact of life, you know, U.S. Medicare, uh, medical uh, stuff, you guys know better than I do. So like for example, and this is set up in a very complex formula, you don't have to worry about it. Uh, the idea is that when year jumps from 0 to 1, uh, you see this guy's total burden to cost goes from 10,333 to 10,797. The idea is that the benefits cost has gone up, the wage cost has gone up, so you know, everything is set automatically. Similarly, I have R&D people, I have sales and marketing people. Uh, I have G and A. G and A is general and administrative. This is your, you know, office managers, your CFO types, accountant types, uh, and this is a simple one. These are only three departments. Any company has more departments, right? I mean, you can have location-wise splits. You can have scientists versus non-scientists split. You can have customer service, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. You can split up sales and marketing into different. But the idea is. You know the salary for each department. You know the people in each department. These are all charted. The charts tab has all of this charted here. Uh, I'm going to just show you. This is the cost, various cost centers. And these are flat because we didn't bother to model down the road. This is just a sample. So here are your costs. This is where I was talking of, you know, on the salary side also, you're thinking company construction. When do I hire engineers? And what do my graphs look like? You know, there's the engineers plateauing out, sales and marketing picking up, and revenue starts to come, the G&A picks up, et cetera, et cetera. So here are we. Here we go through all details of costs. You know, okay, you got a pro this. I'm sorry, this is a software type product. I'm a more software guy. So there is a hosting cost. There is some data services. And what are other costs that are involved in delivering your service, right? Uh, 
there may be other consultant and contractors outside parties you know uh, you may hire outside consultants for a small, short period these are the fireable people these are largely the variable things that you can have these consultants for six months eight months and you will let them go etc cetera, etc cetera. you know an r d uh, you may be you know uh, buying equipment it could be by the month or you can just say you know in this month i'm not going to you know do this fancy formula in this month i know i'm going to spend a hundred thousand dollars and that's it you can type it and by the way in this model i forgot to say everything in yellow is, is your assumptions which you have put in. Everything else computes. Uh, anything in a yellow cell, you hand enter. So if you put this 100,000 like this, uh, for sanity's sake, you make the cell yellow saying, okay, I change this manually. There's an override of the automatic formula because in the month of April, I know I'm going to a conference or we're going to buy a big machine, etc., etc. So, and similarly, there is some advertising, communication, PR, etc. Uh, these are mostly cost per month, but look at travel, it says, you know, again, thinking, operating, uh, how many trips will an employee make, right? For example, in R&D, we make one trip and maybe these guys make two trips a month, right? And so this number of employees multiplied by number of trips, multiplied by cost of trip, and I'm saying down here, the trip costs 1500 bucks. A trip from San Francisco to New York for four days will bar park 1500. Now, if you think you have international travel and the guy goes, you know, selling in other countries, international trip, figure out an average cost is 5,000, 7,000, whatever, put it in here. And again, all these costs inflate on a year on year basis by 4%, right here, right? So these are all assumptions that have gone in, and, uh, and you can say that how many trips, and there could be other costs, you know, the repairs, maintenance, whatever your lines are, you know, what is your legal, what's your finance accounting. You know, you may have some IP, you may have a very specific general purpose lawyer, corporate lawyer and IP lawyer or it could be IP filing fees. So whatever your costs are, think through them on this tab. Every new employee costs me 2500 in laptop and computer cost. Every new employee costs me $1000 of software. Every new employee costs me $1000 in furniture, chairs, etc. You know, new employees come with demands, you know, I need some specialized something. So the idea is that as the employee costs, as the employee go up, this thing will automatically compute that, uh, you know, how many employees do, do we have more employees? This is coming from the employee headcount. And let's say for the heck of it, I make two employees hired here, 40. And it says, aha, you need 5,000 worth of computers, 2,000 of software and 2,000 of furniture fixtures, your balance sheet, your fixed asset that Pete was selling, you know, your, and your depreciation, all that. The mechanical part of accounting gets taken care of by this, right? What do your finances look like? I'll show you in a minute. So you are, these are the assumptions you are making. I'll get to the revenue part in a sec. And all of this wraps up into an income statement. Here are my salary costs by department. Here are my overheads. These overhead come from the cost, these equipment buying or travel, meals, entertainment, PR, marketing. All of that rolls up and it says, okay, you know, what's the P&L of the company? You know, what's the uh, net income of the company? Is there tax in this case like... Uh, uh, Pete was saying earlier, you are loss making for so long uh, that you don't pay any tax. Account for that, but you don't have to pay them. There's nothing to pay. And even after you turn profitable, you have accumulated losses from the past, which you have to first, that's, there's a hole you have dug, first you dig that hole, and when you're net profitable, you start paying taxes. This is just to give you a sense of what department is eating what cost. Again, ratio-wise, you know, these ratios should change over time. R&D should drop as a percentage of expense. Sales and marketing should pick up, etc., etc. Uh, and if you have debt on the company, what is it, role interest and all that. Similarly, we're constructing a balance sheet here. Uh, you know, what is the total cash? Pete walked you through all of this. So this stuff, this is the financial statements being built out of your nitty-gritty salaries and cost tab. Everything is being computed automatically. Uh, in, in real life, in real life, an accounting system does that for you. You enter Starbucks, you enter United Airlines, you enter Hyatt Hotel, and that accounting system adds up and gives you an income statement. Um, what if, for example, you have like um, an IP lawyer that's working um, for um, deferred costs? So, sure. So he, you don't have to pay him yet. Yeah. Should yeah. you already go ahead and put that cost in uh -huh. there? <laughs> this is where I said financial statements are made by finance people and understood by finance people. Not by common people. That's a very good question. So a deferred cost is a cost incurred already. In accounting sense, it is a cost. You have incurred, let's say, barring, assuming nothing else, you, you have a $5,000 deferred cost, you have a loss of $5,000 today. But there is no cash outflow. Mm -hmm. 
So this is where the accrued expenses, these are called accrued expenses as in incurred but not paid. This concept comes into play and what he was talking of gap. Gap says accrued expenses have to be taken into account. In cash basis that expense has not happened. In accrual basis that expense has happened. So now your model should be able to take that these are accrued expenses, it should not hit the cash balance of the company. It should hit the net income but not the cash balance. I am not going to take you through the nitty gritty accounting of it too detailed for this, uh, for this uh, session. But you have to take into account that this is not, but you have to take into account it's not hitting cash today, but you have to show it as an open liability to investors, hey, I got this accrued bill of $50,000, the day you give me a million dollars, the first 50,000 goes to this lawyer. And your investor may question you, you know, what the hell were you doing with this money? So all those questions may come in, so be ready to answer those questions. So back to the revenue which I have not modeled out, so revenue is, is a tricky thing. Now, everybody has a different uh, that is the you know business model of your company, if you will. Uh, this is this was made for a software company. I have not. I, I'll walk you through it, uh, but uh, I'll give you a very simple example, right? Uh, revenue versus cash is very different. So bookings versus revenue versus cash is three completely different concepts, right? And I'll illustrate that. Uh, you sold a machine to somebody uh, for a hundred thousand dollars, okay? Well, you didn't sell them, you leased, them, leased it to them for a year, let's say, or two years. The booking amount is $100,000, but the revenue is zero because the machine has not been used. Revenue means a contract signed, product delivered, and the probability of cash being received. But this machine is going to get used not on day one, but over the next two years. So you will have to recognize $50,000 in the first year, $50,000 in the second year. So bookings is 100, revenue is 50-50. Cash is still zero. Cash depends upon when the guy pays you. Could be this month, could be six months later, and that's a deal that you have struck with them that, okay, push out the payment, try my machine, don't give me cash. Or you say, no, we are very confident, pay the money upfront, otherwise no machine. Depends upon your confidence and how much you can. It's pure negotiation. There is no rules around it, it's a pure negotiating power thing. Am I stronger or are you stronger? Uh, so like, for example, uh, uh, most of the software companies these days, you've heard of the word SaaS a lot, software as a service. Everything is delivered on the go type. Uh, a lot of these companies will say, here's a one-year contract and I need to be paid upfront in cash. Right? Now we're sitting here in the Benioff land, all the buildings have the name Benioff in it. That's all because of SaaS. Right? Mark Benioff made Salesforce, you got the big, you know, 66-story building to prove that. They collect money from everybody upfront. You want one year worth of service, it's $180 per seat per month, you have 100 employees, that's your monthly bill, that's your annual bill. Oh, by the way, here's the invoice, pay me cash, otherwise I'll shut you down in 30 days. Right? Great model. If you can pull it off, then they have the power, they can pull it off. Yeah, thank you for your presentation. Um, so I'd like for you to give us just a couple of comments about risk, if you can. So risk? Uh, you, yeah, about the risk of needing more money, and you're saying you need twice as much, I know that's 100% risk of needing more money, but um, how, when you're looking at your, your models or you're doing any sort of financial projections, it is, is there any consideration to give a risk? Is it just something you would hope to talk through with a potential investor? How, how do you approach it here? Do you breathe? I'm sorry? Do you breathe? Um, I hope so. <laughs> is there oxygen around you? Yes or no answer. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I mean, is there carbon dioxide around you? That's risk. It's around you all the time. You are standing in risk. The whole point of startups is you're highly, highly risky people. You have not people in a moral or any sense of it, but you're, you're taking a very risky endeavor and I'm funding it. So the whole point is risk versus return, right? Now, let's not forget there are only two things that drive uh, uh, investing world, there's fear and greed. Right? There's risk and return, there's fear and greed. Now, how I, I have, I have fear of risk, but I have greed of return. Right? So, how risky are you is drives the valuation. You, know, you asked the question earlier, what's valuation, right? My answer to that is, it's a negotiation between, I'm the funder, you are the entrepreneur, right? We'll negotiate. You think your product is great? I'm going to beat you down saying it's not that great because from here to actual adoption is 10 years and million hurdles. Therefore, there's a lot of risk between 
you know, material uh, realization of profits on your product. So I'll give you a smaller valuation. My million dollars should buy 50% of your company. You guys watch Shark Tank at all? Anybody? Mm -hmm. Right, people go, I'll, I need a million dollars for half the company. And you know, this guy says, no, I'll give you a million dollars, but 80% of company is mine. What is that? That is all about risk sharing. Right? Number one, I can want control of you. Number two, if something goes wrong, that you need more money, tomorrow you will have to sell more parts of the company, right? We will all get what's called diluted down. I own 80% of the company today. If you didn't hit your plan, you're going to get raised another 10 million. The 10 million guy wants another 80% of the company. Where does that 80% come? When, when I own 80, you own 20. Theoretical example. You didn't pan out. You need another 10 million. This guy shows up. He wants another 80%. So obviously, between us, we have 100. How does he get 80, right? So you manufacture new shares. So I have 8 million shares. You have 2 million shares, right? But if he wants 80%, so we will now manufacture new shares. So we have to be diluted down to 20. So there is risk, and the risk is in this that how much dilution will I see, right? As an investor, so I'm covering, as he said, you know, you're looking for three, four, five rounds down the road. So I'm seeing that I will start off as a 30, 40 percent shareholder, but by the time you're successful, I'm down to four or five, and then your exit is a billion, and I'm five percent of the billion. I'll make 50 million dollars, right? So I'm willing to give you no more than five million. So that's the math that's going around in the. Uh, investors mind and they are computing that risk that how, how big of a risk are you versus how big of an opportunity are you uh, you know tackling right if you say you're tackling you know lung cancer I'll give you a lot of money but if you say you're fig figuring out ingrown toenails that's not exactly a big market the risk versus return is always being measured and you're always uh, inside of risks go ahead you're saying? You know, I was thinking ingrown toenails may be a big market. I don't know. My, my son is so. <laughs> <laughs> By the way, if, if, one of the things I didn't mention early on, you know, I, I always say, you know, a slide I took out because I left it to his slides to cover. The one thing I always tell people, you know, <coughs> just because you have a problem doesn't mean everybody has that problem. So, so figure out a market which is large enough. Do enough objective surveys. You know, talk to prospective customers, talk to prospective uh, um, uh, people who are afflicted by the problem that do they have the problem? Will they pay something for it? And how much will they pay? Can you deliver that service at a profit? Yeah, I have an ingrown, I don't have a problem. Let's assume I have an ingrown uh, toenail problem. But I'm not willing to spend more than 10 bucks to solve the problem. And if it takes you 50 bucks to produce that solution, you know, you're out of luck. So, so the one thing I might add on risk is that you might be too focused on the valuation and not look at the investor. So maybe someone is giving you a lower amount of money or taking more of the ownership, kind of to the shark tank example, but actually they bring something to the table that's actually going to make you be more successful yeah. or lower your risk. So you kind of have to look at that too. You shouldn't just focus on the valuation. If that, that investor can help you along the way, that might go a lot long further than taking the, big, the highest bid. Yeah. yeah. Somebody will tell you money is all green, but there are some investors who are greener than others. They, they can open doors for you. Especially in the pharma medical world because everything is so niche and specialized. Till you know the exact right guy, you can't get to the spot. So if you can negotiate valuation, can you negotiate what you deem is risky as well? Of course. It's a conviction game, right? Can you convince me that uh, this product is 100% guaranteed? And that's where the, this is the Remember one of the slides I said, you're always selling. You're selling to investors, you're selling to customers, you're selling to employees, you're selling to your spouse, you know, that I need to be in the office. So you're always selling. And can you sell me enough that uh, this product is, you know, I have done 10 trials, 100% of them were successful. Right? I can say, well, you went for a very specific market, the demo was this or their geography, whatever. I can, I can demolish your thesis that your study is not valid. But if you can tell me that you're 100 percent success in the making, then I'll give you a lot of money. So it's a question of, do I have the scientific knowledge or domain knowledge enough to argue with you? And that is especially true for your universe of medical and pharma and bio, because it requires a lot of scientific knowledge. Otherwise, you know, you could be talking to me all day, it's all above my head. So does the feeling <laughs> that you are forgetting something when you put together a financial model yeah. ever go away? <laughs> no. 
No. Yeah. All right. It doesn't. And the second part of the question is, can we get a, a like copy of the sample? Yeah, yeah, yeah. No. The, the PowerPoint and all this is the, the shield. Leslie will send it to you. Awesome. But yeah, that feeling never goes away. Okay. <laughs> I, I, I'll tell you this. You know, my, my wife makes fun of me. I, I have been now to countless pitches and countless board meetings. I still cannot sleep the night before I have to go. My hands are sweaty. I, I, my hands get cold. I'm just built that way. You're always like, have I thought through all the questions or will there's going to be a zinger that'll come from, oh shit. You don't want that moment. But you know, guess what? Uh, the fact is, uh, don't feel too bad about yourself. Uh, this is your first, second, third, fourth pitch. That guy listens to seven a day. And they are experienced, they know. I mean, I remember making a pitch, I leave the guy's name, firm's name, unknown, but he's the granddaddy around Valley. And if you take his name and the firm name, I'm pitching to him, the third sentence he goes, I'm your third pitch, am I not? Just three sentences out of my mouth, he didn't utter a question. And the first thing he said, I'm your third pitch. And he was right. Just from you know how nervous I am, what the words I've chosen. Because you get beaten up by a few investors, you will polish, right? You will, you, your words become right, you know exactly what points to hit. So it's okay, you're going to screw up, don't worry about it. <coughs> Effort, effort, that's what you focus on. Don't worry on, you know, uh, the, the results part of it. Other questions? Any questions? Pete, why don't you join Sandeep and um, questions for either one of them. You can get them to disagree with each other. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't even bring my baseball bat, otherwise I would have convinced him. <laughs> software out there that can do some basic financial modeling, either from the top down or bottom up you were referring to, or that might incorporate some of these? Yeah, it's called Excel. <laughs> there are other fancy tools, but they are either too expensive or they just take too long to learn. Yeah, I, w I would agree with that. Um, you can find some for biotech, pharma, therapeutics, or diagnostics, or med tech, you can find some specific things on the internet that will give you some examples of things that you might consider. Uh, but at the end of the day, you're going to, Excel gives you the way to specialize it for your own. Yeah. Um, I think you just, if you're not familiar with Excel, the, the thing is the formulas, if those are already set up, it helps. But that, that would be the only thing I would say. But, but that's for financial planning. For the accounting, you're not going to use Excel for accounting once you get your business up and running. But I'll tell you, as a, as a picky finance guy and a modeler, my fear is what she just said. If you take somebody else's model, you don't know how the formula works. You don't know how the connectivity of it works. You're always afraid, did I screw up? And did I screw up and I don't even know it, right? And you look like a you know, complete idiot. You show the model to somebody and they say, duh, right? So that's always a lingering fear. Yeah, I've, I've seen actually where people miss the formula or something and oops, you, they miss like a few hundred thousand dollars in their budget, which was like 20% of their budget or something like that. So <laughs> to be careful. By the way, one thing, if you make a mistake, please admit it right there in front of them. There is absolutely no shame. The worst thing you can do is try to argue with the other guy, no, I'm right, you're not reading it right. That, that's, that kills your reputation, that's, you're done. So, so it, it's no shame saying, yeah, I made a mistake. Everybody makes a mistake. How do we find good CFO-like uh, counsel and assistance at such an early age without cash? Without cash? Yeah. That's a tricky one. I'm not everybody will work for free uh, or equity. Uh, but yeah, you have to know people. I mean, you, you, this is part of the purpose of such classes is you get to know people. So, so I would say that um, there are people that will work for equity, those that somewhat retired and really like the field. I know there are some people in the bio area that, that have taken chances. This is actually uh, a well-known um, venture capitalist that started out as a CFO or, and he ret retired as a CFO and actually used to work for free and to potentially get come and then just take the investment and then from that he created his own venture firm. It's actually called Frazier and Company based in Seattle. Uh, they're well known in the healthcare space. Um, but uh, aside from that, I just say you don't really need, you, you, you don't need a CFO at this point in time. I've been a CFO for private companies. Um, a lot of companies will not even get a CFO till they're thinking about going public. Yeah. They'll use more of a controller, accountant, 
someone that has services like Sandeep, then you might bring somebody in to help you raise money. You could always use a banker, although they'll charge a fee. But a lot of times, I think you can go, given where you are and the access you have to the community, you can go directly to those investors. You don't really need a CFO at the beginning. The CFO, what I do for my company is I help raise money, but now it's on a public market, convertible debt, a lot of different things than just selling stock. So um, at, it, it, at that point, you obviously would need a CFO, but early on, I don't think you need a CFO. You, you need a bookkeeper and you need a modeler. For all what he talked of, you need a bookkeeper. For all what I talked of, you need a modeler. Modeler is a person who has a general business sense, doesn't know your things right, but they are gods in Excel. Right? They can make Excel is a specialized calculator, for the lack of a better phrase, and specialized to your particular need. It's a very flexible calculator, and, and you need somebody to be able to run that machine. So, so find a modeler and a bookkeeper, and you're good. I just want to make a comment. This very detailed budgeting that uh, Sandeep just explained, that really makes you think through your company, right? That's the real benefit of it, is like, what do we really need and what's it gonna cost us? So, you know, so many people come and they say, well, I'm gonna hire a BD person and I'm gonna hire a whatever and I need three more scientists and so on. But then when you build it up, you know, okay, what exactly are the three scientists gonna do? Do we, do we really need three of them? Could we make do with one? Or are we gonna have a shortfall? What could we, um, what could we outsource rather than actually hire an employee and have to pay all those benefits? So just going through this exercise really helps you figure out what your company is going to do and what it needs. So let's thank Sandeep and Pete for their presentation. <laughs>